Yes, we're bound to Canaan, a land the Lord God had prepared for all of us, and only those who made the decision to follow Jesus will get there. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, what a joyful privilege you gave us that we can be called your children. Thank you. Because we are your children, we are bound to enter into the glories of your kingdom. Please continue to guide and direct us. And as we ponder continually in your words, help us to say what you really want us to do. Help us to know how you want us to live. And in your strength and power, give us, O oh Father, the determination to live only for you. Fill us, please, with your spirit. As we study your words again tonight, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The title of our study tonight is Five to One. Five to One is not the upcoming winning set of numbers in the next small time lotto game. Five to One is neither the measurement of the piece of wood which you will need to pry open that door that bars your way into getting your much-needed rest after a hard day's work. And definitely, 5 to 1 is not the number to open my cash vault. Since I am as poor as a rat, I definitely would not need a cash vault, and I don't have one. 5 to 1, however are significant numbers in the parable of the talents found in Matthew 25, chapter 25, verses 14 to 30. That parable tells the story of a merchant who, who entrusted his servants with money, talents, for them to invest while the merchant goes for a long journey. At his return, he was expecting his servants to have made a wise use of those he entrusted to them. Soon after, he went. He went off to his long journey. When he left, the first servant invested the five talents given him by his master and gained five more. The second servant invested the two he also received from his master and earned two more. For reasons he only knew, the third servant took the single talent he received and instead of investing it for gain, he hid it in the earth and kept it there until his master returned. According to the parable, which is almost allegorical with its, with its multifaceted features, when the master came back, he asked his servants to account for what they received. And as you all know, that servant who gained five talents out of the five he invested, together with the second servant who gained two talents for the two he invested, both of them received commendation from their master. Their master said to both of them, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Well, you know it. The third servant who received one talent and hid it in the earth that it did not gain anything 
he received condemnation and very, very harsh words from the master. And if you will closely look into it, the penalty was given for the servant who did not make use of the talent given him. The penalty seemed somewhat too cruel and unjustified. In verse 26 of chapter 25, we read, But his Lord answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy, lazy servant, you knew that I rip where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. The master called that unprofitable servant wicked and lazy. Now, there are certain cultures where not investing somebody else's money that was entrusted to you may not be termed an act of laziness. It might be termed an act of playing safe. After all, you don't know what's going to happen to the market. In a volatile market, you don't want to waste money. And so, what's the best thing to do? Keep it. Don't take risks. But this master called this person lazy. And I think for that master to characterize him as wicked seemed to be overly stated. That is, until we learn that being lazy the King James version, version uses the word slothful. The word slothful is equivalent to someone who is foolish, whose foolishness leads to adopting ways of life that end up in disaster or even death. So in Proverbs 21, 25, we are reminded that the desire of the lazy man kills him for his hands refuse to labor. Death is clearly closer to the man who refuses to labor and toil by which he shall also lack the substances needed to sustain life. But the industrious and the energetic, in contrast, have no lack for sustenance because their hands find enough to do to provide for a living. In Proverbs 15:19. The slothful is contrasted to the righteous. Such comparison gives the idea that if the righteous ends up living, surely the end of the slothful is dying. So that one lazy, slothful servant was castigated, criticized, and surprisingly was eventually ostracized by his expectant masters. Master. Ostracized to where? Condemned to what? Matthew 25, 30 gives the answer. The wicked, lazy servant was cast out into outer darkness. And there will be whipping and gnashing of teeth. Before we go further, thank you. Before we go further into the significance of this phraseology, whipping and gnashing of teeth, let us first of all determine what is really involved in this parable. In using talents, Jesus certainly was not referring to abilities or gifts given to people. For the parable looks at the talents as monetary units with which the servants must trade. Oh, certainly there will be some allusions to abilities given to people, 
and that people who receive such abilities or gifts from God must give a good account of those gifts and the use made of them. However, in the context of the discourses of Jesus beginning in maybe as early as Matthew 23, up to the end of Matthew 26, we are looking at situations that relate to the last days. Some scholars favor the use of talents referring to special privileges and opportunities given to people with which they must faithfully exploit or employ before the coming master. Some would consider the idea relates to reliability. The master, after all, has given money to his servants while he went to a far country and expected his servants to be reliable enough that, when, that they make good use of the money given to them so that when he returns, they will account to him what they have done at his return, by which they can be viewed as reliable servants, trustworthy servants. I think there is a sense in which the point here is stressed is that of readiness to give an account of whatever the master has entrusted to his children, whether that makes them reliable or accountable or both. For when the entire context of the last days are taken into account, this parable tells us that there are responsibilities given to us, expected of us that we should discharge or should have discharged as disciples of God. Whether those responsibilities are small or great, it is the master who allocates them to each of us. And every servant is expected to carry out faithfully that role entrusted to him. So we can say, yes, primarily this is about money. But homiletically, we can also say that this may refer to things that were given to us apart from money. We can also say that these are, or this may be referring to opportunities that were given to us. Opportunities to serve. Opportunities to preach the gospel. Opportunities to lead somebody to Jesus. Opportunities that otherwise would not mean anything at all. If we are not attached or connected to Jesus. When you look closely at Matthew, especially chapter 24 and on to the end of the book, you will find that there is an extreme sense of urgency with which we are to answer the next questions. Mark as a book. The book of Mark is a book that is full of immediate words, words immediate. There is a sense of immediacy, there is a sense of urgency in the book of Mark. But here also in the book of Matthew, in these chapters, we sense an urgency that needs to be understood. Jesus did not speak parables out of a vacuum. Most times, there were groups of people to whom he directed his words. In this instance, we need to ask the question, to whom did Jesus address this particular parable? It will surprise you that in Matthew 23, we find a chapter full of condemnatory words, sharp words directed to those who professed to be the leaders of the nation. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, even the scribes. It is not far-fetched that this parable could be directed to the same group, especially in the light of the third servant who did nothing 
but hide that talent given to him. Come with me and note the scornful words and sarcastic tone of voice that the third servant employed in answering the question of the master. Because we find in verses 24 and 25 of chapter 25, these words, these words of the servant. Then the man who received the servant, then the man who received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. It's like speaking full of sarcasm. Here is your money. Here is what belongs to you. Would a servant respectful of his master carry that kind of tone of voice as he speaks or converses with his master? Hardly. Hardly. And yet, we find this servant speaking scornfully about the activities of his master. And if you will just let go, your imagination do things for you, this servant was almost ready to throw that talent back to his master and tell him, See, here, take what belongs to you. Almost disrespectful. So when we consider that third servant, we can say that the original application of this parable seemed appropriate to have the Pharisees in mind. What did the Pharisees do? Or what did they receive? They received the Torah. They received the Torah and the oral law with great care from their predecessors. Ultimately, yes, it came from God. They preserved it unchanged. Oh, wait. I might have spoken too soon. They preserved the very Torah, but they did something else. They came up with laws, with regulations, with commandments by which they thought that by keeping or making those commandments around the Torah, when somebody breaks those commandments, at least those commandments are broken, but not the Torah itself. Ingenious, eh? So they will say, on a Sabbath day, you cannot travel more than a Sabbath day's journey. If you break that commandment, at least you break that Sabbath day's journey regulation, but not the Sabbath commandment. Ingenious of the Pharisees. And it's like they kept the Torah in a napkin like the man in your parable. The man kept the talent in a napkin. He buried it where ordinary people cannot get at it. And the Pharisees, they kept the Torah in a place where people cannot get at it. They, leaders of the people, they have a responsibility not just to the people but to God as well. They did not use their responsibility well. They were given opportunities, chances to lead these people back to an understanding of who God is. Instead, they made following God very, very difficult. They made entry into the kingdom very, very hard for people. It's no wonder when you go towards the end of chapter 
11, Matthew 11, 28 and 29, you have there the appeal of Jesus. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The Pharisees did everything they can to make it difficult for people to follow God. They lost sight of the opportunity given to them, given them to lead the people of God back to an understanding of who God really is and to an understanding of, God, what, of what really God wanted His people to do. They wanted a religion without change and a religion without risk. The only change that God is asking of His people to have is not really a big change. Well, the things that relate to that initial change, of course, are many. But the initial change is not really difficult at all because the initial change is a change of heart. A change of heart. The Pharisees wanted a religion with all kinds of forms, with all kinds of religiosity, without a heart. It is a religion without risk. And they, for what they did, were worthily condemned for it. They are worthless servants who will have their prized possessions, the law taken away from them, and they will find themselves outside the kingdom in outer darkness. Lest I be condemned for being too hard on the Pharisees, let me tell you this. This parable has a wider application. It doesn't just apply to the Pharisees, but it applies to all who are determined to retain the status quo and avoid risk and change in their religion to all who refuse to trade with the responsibilities the Master gives them. You know, I like very much. And I loved it a lot when our general conference president took up the theme revival and reformation. And our division here took up the theme following that revival, reformation, and beyond. North Philippine Union Conference followed it up, took that same theme. And for the next five years, we are going to be emphasizing upon our people the need for us to be changed, the need to, for us to be revived, to be transformed after the similitude of Christ. This is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity that is given to the people of God before they pass away from this world, from this earth. Well, you know this, there was a time in the Bible when Mary received a great favor from Jesus. And she was always looking for opportunities to return the favor to Jesus. She found that opportunity when one time Jesus was in the house of Simon and in the front before all the people there looking at Mary, they saw Mary pour out this flask of alabaster upon Jesus. There are opportunities that when they are presented to you, sometimes you have to grab them, hold them on, because some opportunities when they are given to you and you don't grab them, they pass on never to return. The Pharisees were given that opportunity to lead the people of God back to an understanding of God. The Pharisees, the leaders of their times, were given the opportunity 
to know God in Jesus. But instead of accepting Jesus, they rejected Jesus. Instead of recognizing the authority of Jesus, they turned their backs on Him. They are, in the context of our studies, they are to be ostracized. They will find themselves outside the kingdom in outer darkness. There is a fascinating parallel between spiritual and natural laws. If you develop your muscles, your reward is you can carry heavier burdens and still feel good, right? To you who have more, to you who have more will be given, will be given. If you do not use what you have, what has been given to you, that which remains with you might also be taken away. There is a law of nature. What you don't use, you lose. If you lie on bed and do nothing, the law of atrophy takes over. You can find you can do less and less. You lose the pathetic muscles you once had. It is like that in the spiritual realm. When somebody acts reliably under the responsibilities the master has entrusted to him, his capacities will grow. If nothing is done with them, the ability to respond and be useful will diminish to a vanishing point. The image is dynamic and organic. It is a powerful spur to responsibility in the service of the master and a warning against his lawfulness, whether induced by laziness, fear of change, or unwillingness to take risks. People of God, Jesus is coming, and He is coming very, very soon. To us today is given opportunities to do what we can do, what we must do, what we should do to save others who also have the right to the kingdom of God. Now, wait a minute. This parable draws our attention very, very forcefully to something that is a consequence of that servant not using the opportunity given to him to do what he must do. We read in verse 29 and also in verse 30, for to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. And look, verse 30. And cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. Cast, cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That last line is a line that is a very graphic presentation of what's in store for that person who, after he has been given possibilities, potentials for growth, or maybe even real money, and he didn't use those things for the honor and glory of God. And he did not use those things so that the work of God might be pursued relentlessly. There is only one thing that waits for him. Outer darkness. In the Bible, that word or that phrase, outer darkness, is synonymous with eternal death. 
and you'll find people weeping, gnashing their teeth, not because they feel cold or not because they don't have anything to eat, but because they are full of hatred of themselves because the opportunities given to them were not taken advantage of. They will be whipping and gnashing their teeth. Nobody, nobody who accepted the name of Jesus, nobody who trusted in Jesus, nobody who constantly made the decision to link with Jesus will suffer the fate of that third servant. Or, did I speak too soon? While we are here on this earth, we will always be subject to the temptations around us. We will always be subject to this fleshly body. And it is so very important that we have to have that constant connection with Jesus. It is so important that we have always this desire to be with Jesus because we know very well, apart from Jesus, we cannot do anything. Apart from Jesus, we will not even desire to use the talents that we have. Separate from Jesus. If we have talents, whether they are abilities or money or gifts God gave us, apart from Jesus, though those things that we received from God will only be used for the glorification of self. For egotistical purposes. That's why it's dangerous to separate from Jesus. Jesus knows our frame. We are weak. I remember the story of the disciples. Peter was very vocal. When Jesus was telling them that it is necessary for him to go through much difficulties, he will... He will be suffering and ultimately he will die. All of the apostles, Peter primarily was saying, No, Lord, those things will not happen to you. Until Jesus came to the point where he told Peter, Before the cock will crow three times, before the cock will crow, you will have denied me three times. In the fleshly heart of Peter, he was trying to convince himself, no, it will not happen. And just before Jesus was arrested, you know what happened? You know what happened? Jesus invited his three disciples to go with him into the inner portion of Gethsemane. And he told his three disciples, stay here, watch and pray so that you will not enter into temptation. And then he went inside the garden, prayed, prayed the prayer that led him, that gave him the strength to face Calvary. He was praying, Father, if it is only possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not your will, not my will, but your will be done. He stood up, went back to his disciples three times. These disciples who were so bold to say that they will not leave Jesus. These disciples who were so brave to say that they will always stay with Jesus. Jesus found them sleeping at a time when they need to be praying, at a time when they need to be drawing very, very close to the Father for strength. 
at a time when they need to have the power of the Spirit to carry them over those very, very testing times. Where were they? Sleeping. When they should be praying. They let that opportunity go. It's just good that in God's graciousness, in Jesus' graciousness, they were still given the opportunity to carry on, to overcome their defects of character. Jesus said in Matthew 26, verse 41, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Many times we underestimate the power of sin working in us. Sometimes we underestimate the capability of sin to draw us away from the master. But every opportunity given to us to stay close to Jesus, to decide for Jesus, grab hold of those opportunities because when you don't grab hold of them, sin will grab hold of you and you might find yourself in outer darkness. What if when sin grabs hold of you, you suddenly lose your life? What will be your end? Where will you be found? That is why it is so necessary, brethren, it is so necessary that every day of our lives, every moment of our waking hours, we have this constant connection with Jesus. We must allow our whole lives to be permeated by the Spirit of Jesus so that He will work in us, so that those abilities, responsibilities, or maybe even real treasure, real money, given to us may be used for Him so that we may not waste those that were given to us. I like very much our theme song. Jesus is coming again. Is it possible for you to flash the chorus for that theme song? I sang this theme song when I was in college. That's way back, 1974. And I cannot forget the th the, the, some of the changes that were made in that theme song. Okay? Coming again, coming again, maybe morning, maybe gone, <laughs> maybe noon, maybe evening, and maybe soon. Hey, Jesus is coming. Yeah, maybe morning. Yeah, maybe noon. Yeah, maybe evening. But not maybe soon. Jesus is coming surely soon. Surely. Surely. He is coming. Let's not doubt it. Let's not hesitate that Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming for sure. He is coming very, very soon. I don't know about you, but I've been trying to follow the events that are happening in this world today. I've been trying to follow the growth of technology. And many times, I find myself facing the realization that, yes, remember Daniel 12? In the last days, Men will run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. In the last 30 years, the knowledge that has been discovered by this present generation has tripled many, many, many times. Not too long ago, I opened the internet and uh, I was surprised well, not surprised anymore because 
There's just too many things that people today have um, mastered to the point where you just lose that element of surprise. But more than a week ago, there was launched the fastest moving vehicle on earth. How fast is the fastest vehicle that you know? This one was like a glider. A jet plane. How fast would a jet plane be? How many times the speed of sound? Mach 2? Mach 3? This glider is able to fly, to glide at the speed of 26,000 miles per hour. That's unheard of. And there is this secret that they're trying to keep secret, but it was picked up in the internet. A most powerful computer that can take in billions and billions of data. And you know how big this computer is? It is so big that it will fit into the tip of a needle. Unheard of. But in the last days, these are going to be the manifestations of the age. Jesus is coming soon. He is coming soon. He is coming very, very soon. Not maybe soon, but surely, surely soon. Brethren, the opportunities given to you and to me are opportunities that are great. Especially opportunities of leading this church, this people of God, into a life of holiness, into a life of readiness, into a life of preparation for the soon coming of Jesus. Let us take hold of that opportunity or else our end will be like the end of that third servant. He, he will be cast out. He was cast out into outer darkness and there was whipping and gnashing of teeth. That should not be our end because our end should be glorious. Because the kingdom of God in all its glory is waiting for us and the Lord is waiting for us to be ushered in into that glorious kingdom. The kingdom beckons. The kingdom calls for you and for me. How shall we answer? Yes, Lord, sinful as I am, I want to enter into the glories of your kingdom. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, here we are presenting to you our weak, puny, sinful selves. Please, take hold of ourselves. Fill us with your mighty spirit Help us to always look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Help us to always be linked with Him, to have that strong connection with Him, a connection that will grow stronger and stronger as we continue to focus our hearts and our minds, our sights on Jesus. Oh, Father, let your whole spirit your spirit so fully, wholly possess us that in your strength and power we may do the works that you want us to do. We may carry out the responsibilities you have given us to do. We may be your partner in leading your people to a life of preparation for the soon coming of our Savior. Let this be our experience, O oh Father. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.